Putney Theatre Company presents an adaptation of Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter 2 Joe, some English friends are coming to see me tomorrow. I'm going to Longmeadow and I'll row up the whole crew to lunch and croquet, have a fire, make messes and all sorts of larks. Uh, do say you'll come. Mrs. March was happy for the girls to go and enjoy the summer. The sun was shining bright and everyone was up early and ready for their day at the beach. Laurie's friends were the three Vaughan children. Kate, the eldest, was quite standoffish, maybe thinking she was too old for days at the beach. The twins, Fred and Ned, were Meg's age and couldn't be more different from each other. Meg had brought along Sally Gardner and Mr. Brooke made up the party. Let's play croquet before it gets too hot. I'll be captain, and Mr. Brooke, you captain the other team? Right. Miss March, would you care to play? There are four Miss Marches, Mr. Brooke. I give you full permission to call us by our first names. Makes life easier for everyone. Quite right. Miss Meg, care to play? Absolutely. Joe, come on, I could do with a fighter. Ned, want to join in? Rather. Come on, Fred. We'll play Mr. Brooke. Don't forget about me. Everyone enjoyed the game, with Fred and Joe maybe getting a little too involved and both becoming overly competitive. Fred took his turn to get through the last hoop. His ball hit the wicket and stopped an inch on the wrong side. No one was very near, and running up to examine it, he gave it a sly nudge with his toe, which just put it an inch on the right side. I'm through. You pushed it. I saw you. It's my turn now. On my word, I didn't move it. It rolled a bit, perhaps, but that is allowed. We don't cheat in America, but you can if you choose. Good for you, Joe. He did cheat. I saw him. He can't tell him so, but he won't do it again. Take my word for it. Time for lunch. Who can make good coffee? Joe can. What shall we do when we can't eat any more? I dare say Miss Kate knows something new and nice. Go and ask her. Jealous? <laughs> of what? I thought she'd suit Brooke, but he keeps talking to Meg. Kate, have you got any good ideas for some after-lunch entertainment? Do you know truth? What is it? Why, you all choose a card. The first person to draw a picture card has to answer truly any question put by the rest. It's great fun. Let's try it. You draw first. Eight. Jack. <sighs> Who are your heroes? Grandfather and Napoleon. Which lady here do you think prettiest? Amy. Which do you like best? Joe, of course. What silly questions you ask. Oh, a four. King! Did you cheat at croquet? Well, yes. Little bit. Ha <laughs> ha! I think truth is a very silly game. While they had been playing truth, Kate, Meg, and Mr. Brooke had taken themselves under a tree. Kate with her sketches, and Mr. Brooke with his book. How beautifully you sketch. I wish I could draw. Why don't you learn? I haven't time. I forgot young ladies in America go to school more than us. You go to a private one, I suppose. I don't go at all. I'm a governess myself. Oh, indeed. Young ladies in America love independence as much as their ancestors did and are admired and respected for supporting themselves. Oh, yes, of course. It's very nice and proper for them to do so. We have many most respectable and worthy young women who do the same and are employed by the nobility. You two must have much to discuss, both being teachers to good families. I'll let you swap lessons. I forgot that English people rather turn up their noses at governesses and don't treat them as we do. Tutors also have rather a hard time of it there, as I know to my sorrow. There's no place like America for us workers, Miss March. Please call me Meg, Mr. Brooke. I only wished I liked teaching as you do. Then you should call me John. I think you would if you had Laurie for a pupil. I shall be very sorry to lose him next year. Going to college, I suppose. Well, what becomes of you when he leaves? Yes, it's high time he went, and as soon as he is off, I shall turn soldier. 
if I am needed. I should think every young man would want to go, though it is hard for the mothers and sisters who stay at home. I have neither, and very few friends to care whether I live or die. I would. That is, we should all be very sorry to have any harm happen to you. Thank you. That sounds pleasant. But before Mr. Brooke could say any more, they were both roped into playing more games and watching performances. The summer was a joyful one, the day at the beach being just one day of many filled with laughter and happiness. Laurie and Mr. Brooke became more and more like part of the March family. During a September picnic, enjoying the last of the summer sunshine, the sisters told Laurie and Mr. Brooke about dreaming of their castles in the air. Wouldn't it be fun if all the castles in the air which we could make could come true and we could live in them? I've made such quantities it would be hard to choose which I'd have. You'd have to take your favorite one. What is it? If I tell mine, will you tell yours? No one would be interested in mine. I would. Truly, I would want nothing more than a clever wife and a cozy home. That would be a happy life. I hope you have something more interesting than that, Lori. After I'd seen as much of the world as I want to, I'd like to settle in Germany to be a famous musician myself. And I'm never to be bothered about money or business, but just enjoy myself and live for what I like. That's my favorite castle. What's yours, Meg? I should like a lovely house full of all sorts of luxurious things. Pretty clothes, pleasant people, and heaps of money. Oh, how I should enjoy it. I wouldn't be idle, but do good, and make everyone love me dearly. Wouldn't you have a master for your castle in the air? I said pleasant people, you know. Why don't you say you'd have a splendid, wise, good husband, and some angelic little children? You know your castle wouldn't be perfect without. You'd have nothing but horses, inkstands, and novels in yours. Wouldn't I, though? My books should be as famous as Laurie's music. I want to do something splendid before I go into my castle. Something heroic or wonderful that won't be forgotten after I'm dead. I mean to astonish you all some day. I shall write books and get rich and famous. That would suit me, so that is my favorite dream. Mine is to stay at home, safe with father and mother, and help take care of the family. Don't you wish for anything else? Since I had my little piano... I am perfectly satisfied. I only wish we may all keep well and be together. Nothing else. I have ever so many wishes, but the pet one is to be an artist and go to Rome and do fine pictures and be the best artist in the whole world. We're an ambitious set, aren't we? Well, except Mr. Brooke. I do wonder if any of us will ever get our wishes. I've got the key to my castle in the air. But whether I can unlock the door remains to be seen. I've got the key to mine, but I'm not allowed to try it. Hang college. If I had a new box of drawing pencils, I'd have mine. If we are all alive in ten years, let's meet and see how many of us have got our wishes, or how much nearer we are then than now. I'd be so old. Twenty-nine. That's nothing. I'll be thirty-two. You and I will be twenty-eight, Teddy. <laughs> I hope I shall have done something to be proud of by that time, but I'm such a lazy dog. I'm afraid I shall dawdle, Joe. As the October days began to grow chilly, Joe was very busy in the garret. For two or three hours, the sun lay warmly in the high window, showing Joe seated on the old sofa, writing busily with her papers spread out upon a trunk before her. She was quite absorbed in her work and hardly saw anyone. One could even say she became quite secretive. Where have you been? I haven't seen you in months. Not months. Well, weeks then. You are up to something, Joe March. No, I'm not. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. Fine. I'll trade you my secret for one of yours. Deal. Well... I've left two stories with a newspaper man, and he's going to give his answer next week, whether he'll publish them. Miss March, the celebrated American authoress. Shh, it won't come to anything, but I couldn't rest till I had tried. It won't fail. Why, Joe, your stories are works of Shakespeare compared to half the rubbish that is published every day. 
Where's your secret? Play fair, Teddy. I know where Meg's glove is. Is that all? Someone has it. Who? Mr. Brooke. Isn't that romantic? No, it's horrid. Don't you like it? Of course I don't. I'm disgusted and wish you hadn't told me. I thought you'd be pleased. At the idea of anybody coming to take Meg away? No, thank you. Jo felt her mind swim at the idea of her sister one day having someone who she loved more than her sisters. The smooth road sloped invitingly before her, finding the temptation irresistible. Jo darted away, soon leaving hat and comb behind her and scattering hairpins as she ran. She reached her home panting with flying hair, bright eyes, ruddy cheeks, and no signs of dissatisfaction in her face. You have been running. When will you stop such romping ways? Don't try and make me grow up before my time, Meg. It's hard enough to have you change all of a sudden. Let me be a little girl as long as I can. What are you talking about, you silly goose? Jo turned away to hide the trembling of her lips. Valari's secret made her dread the separation, which now seemed very near. For a week or two, Jo behaved so queerly that the sisters were quite bewildered. She rushed to the door when the postman rang, was rude to Mr. Brooke whenever they met, and would sit looking at Meg with a woe-begone face. What shall we do with that girl? She never will behave like a young lady. I hope she won't. She's so funny and dear as she is. It's very trying. At that moment, Jo bounced in, holding a newspaper. Anything interesting in there? A story. Won't amount to much, I guess. You'd better read it aloud. That will amuse us and keep you out of mischief. The Rival Painters. <clears throat> Joe began to read very fast. The girls listened with interest, for the tale was romantic and somewhat pathetic, as most of the characters died in the end. I like that about the splendid picture. I prefer the lovers. Viola and Angelo are two of my favorite names. Isn't that queer? Who wrote it? Your sister. You? It's very good. I knew it! I knew it! Oh, my Joe, I am so proud! Tell us about it! Oh, when did it come? How much did you get for it? What will Father say? Joe wrapped her head in the paper, and she bedewed her little story with a few natural tears. For to be independent and earn the praise of those she loved were the dearest wishes of her heart, and this seemed to be the first step towards that happy end. November blew in with bitter winds and grey days. One morning the house was busy. Laurie wanted to give Joe a ride to work. Beth and Amy were busy with their chores, and Meg was trying to find her hat. In the midst of all that mundanity, the winter wind blew in an unwanted message. It's one of them potted telegraph things, ma'am. Give it here. Oh, God. Mrs. March, stop. Your husband is very ill. Stop. Come at once. Stop. S. Blank Hospital, Washington. How still the room was, they listened breathlessly. How strangely the day darkened outside, and how suddenly the whole world seemed to change, as the girls gathered about their mother, feeling as if all the happiness and support of their lives was about to be taken from them. I shall go at once. I only hope it's not too late. We won't waste no time a-crying, but get your things ready right away, ma'am. Hannah's right. There's no time for tears now. Where's Laurie? Here. How can I help? Send a telegram saying I will come at once. The next train goes early in the morning. I'll take that. Uh, take this note to Aunt March as well, Joe. Run. Everyone scattered like leaves before a gust of wind, and the quiet, happy household was broken up as suddenly as if the paper had been an evil spell. Mr. Lawrence came to Marmy's side as soon as he heard the news. There was nothing he didn't offer down to his own dressing gown. The house was busier than it had ever been, everyone working to remove as much worry as possible from Mrs. March. Meg ran down the stairs with a pair of boots in one hand and a cup of tea in the other, straight into Mr. Brooke. Oh, 
Oh, I, I'm so sorry. Not at all. I'm very sorry to hear about your father, Miss March. Thank you. We're busy getting everything ready for Marmy's trip. Of course. I don't mean to get in the way. I just came to offer myself as escort to your mother. Really, John? Well, how kind you are. Mother will accept, I'm sure. And it will be such a relief to know that she has someone to take care of her. Thank you. Very, very much. Uh, come in. Come, tell Mother. What a generous offer, Mr. Brooke. Are you sure you can spare her, Mr. Lawrence? I insist. I have business in Washington, John. You can carry that out for me as well. Of course. Joe, where have you been? That's my contribution toward making Father comfortable and bringing him home. Dear, where did you get it? Twenty-five dollars? Joe, I hope you haven't done anything rash. No, it's mine, honestly. I didn't beg, borrow, or steal it. I earned it, and I don't think you'll blame me, for I only sold what was my own. Your hair! <gasps> oh, your beautiful hair! Oh, Joe! How could you? You're one beauty! She doesn't look like my Joe anymore, but I love her dearly for it. It doesn't affect the fate of the nation, so don't wail. I'm satisfied, so please take the money and let's have supper. My dear, it was not necessary. You'll regret this, Joe. No, I won't. What made you do it? I had to do something for Father. Didn't you feel dreadfully when the first cut came? I took a last look at my hair while the man got his scissors. And that was the end of it. It's late, my dears. There's no more to be done tonight. Go to bed and no arguing. I mean, we must be up early and she'll need all the sleep we can get. Good night, my darlings. Beth and Amy soon fell asleep in spite of the great trouble. But Meg lay awake, thinking the most serious thoughts she had ever known in her short life. Jo lay motionless, and her sister fancied that she was asleep till a stifled sob made her exclaim as she touched a wet cheek. <gasps> jo? What is it? <gasps> Are you crying about father? <laughs> no. Well, what then? My... My hair. <laughs> I'm not sorry. I'd do it again tomorrow if I could. It's only the vain part of me that goes and cries in this silly way. The next morning, the big trunk stood ready in the hall. Meg's eyes kept filling in spite of herself. Jo was obliged to hide her face more than once, and the little girls wore a grave, troubled expression, as if sorrow was a new experience to them. Nobody talked much, but... As the time drew very near and they sat waiting for the carriage. Girls, Hannah and Mr. Lawrence will look after you while I'm gone. Hannah is faithfulness itself, and our good neighbor will guard you as if you were his own. Hope and keep busy while I'm gone. And whatever happens, remember that you can never be fatherless. Yes, mother. Meg, watch over your sisters. Joe, write to me often and be my brave girl. Beth, comfort yourself with your music, and Amy, help all you can. I will, Mother. Goodbye, my darlings, goodbye. How kind everyone is to us. I don't see how they can help it, Mrs. March. Now let's get you to Washington. Now, my dear young ladies, remember what your ma said, and don't fret. Come and have a cup of coffee all round, and then let's fall to work and be a credit to the family. While Mrs. March was away, news from their father comforted the girls very much. For though dangerously ill, the presence of the best and tenderest of nurses had already done him good. Relieved of their first anxiety about their father, the girls relaxed their praiseworthy efforts a little and began to fall back into old ways. Meg, I wish you'd go and see the Hummels. You know Mother told us not to forget them. Oh, I'm too tired to go this afternoon. Can't you, Joe? Too stormy for me with my cold. I thought you were almost well. It's well enough for me to go out with Laurie, but not well enough to go to the Hummels. Why don't you go yourself? I have been, every day. But the baby is sick. And I don't know what to do for it. It gets sicker and sicker. And I think you or Hannah ought to go. I promise I'll go tomorrow. Ask Hannah for some nice little treats and take it round, Beth. The air will do you good. I'd go, but I want to finish my writing. My head aches and I'm tired, so I thought maybe some of you would go. Amy will be in presently and she will run down for us. So Beth lay down on the sofa. 
the others returned to their work, and the hummels were forgotten. An hour passed. Amy did not come. Meg went to her room to try on a new dress. Joe was absorbed in her story, and Hannah was sound asleep before the kitchen fire when Beth quietly went out into the chilly air. It was late when she came back, and no one saw her creep upstairs and shut herself into her mother's room. Hours later, Joe stumbled upon Beth by the medicine cabinet. Christopher Columbus, what's the matter? You've had this scarlet fever, haven't you? Years ago, when Meg did. Why? Oh, Joe, the baby's dead. What baby? Mrs. Hummels. It died in my lap before she got home. Oh, Beth. I saw in a minute it was sicker, and Mrs. Hummel had gone for a doctor. It seemed to sleep, but all of a sudden it gave a little cry and trembled, and then lay very still. I tried to warm its feet and give it some milk, but it didn't stir, and I knew it was dead. There was nothing more you could have done. The doctor said it was scarlet fever. All the humble children have it. He told me to go home and take Belladonna right away, or I'd have the fever. I'm sure you'll be fine. I'd never forgive myself if you got sick. I guess I shan't have it badly. It begins with headache, sore throat, and queer feelings like mine. So I did take some belladonna, and I feel better. Hannah? Hannah? What's all the hollering? It's Beth. She's sick. She went to see the Hummels, and the baby has scarlet fever. Head. Let me look at your child. Don't let Amy come. She never had it. Can you and Meg have it again? I guess not. Serve me right, selfish pig, to let you go and stay riding rubbish myself. We will have Dr. Bangs just to take a look at you, dear, and see that we start right. Then we'll send Amy off to Aunt March's for a spell to keep her out of harm's way. And one of you girls can stay at home and amuse Beth for a day or two. I'll stay. Amy rebelled outright and passionately declared that she had rather have the fever than go to Aunt March. Meg reasoned, pleaded, and commanded all in vain. Amy protested that she would not go, and Meg left her in despair to ask Hannah what should be done. Before she came back, Laurie walked into the parlour to find Amy sobbing. She told her story, expecting to be consoled. <laughs> There's no need to cry about it. Do as they say. You go to Aunt March's, and I'll come and take you out every day, driving or walking, and, and we'll have capital times. Won't that be better than moping here? I don't wish to be sent off as if I was in the way. Bless your heart. It's to keep you well. You don't want to be sick, do you? I don't want you to get sick. But it's dull at Aunt March's and she is so cross. It won't be dull, with me popping in every day to tell you how Beth is and take you out gallivanting. The old lady likes me, and I'll be as sweet as possible to her so she won't peck at us, whatever we do. Will you come every single day? See if I don't. And bring me back the minute Beth is well. The identical minute. Well, as a favor to you, I'll go. That's my girl. Call Meg and tell her you've given in. You're going? I will go. For the good of the family. Well, that's very... Good of you. Meg, Dr. Bangs is here. How is she, Doctor? It is scarlet fever. So, Amy, you'll be leaving right away, won't you? <laughs> Why does everyone want me to leave? Ignore her. Your sister should get better under your care. I'll come along and check on her next week. Amy was set off at once to Aunt March's with Joe and Laurie as escort. No more than I expected, if you're allowed to go poking around among poor folks. Amy can stay and make herself useful if she isn't sick, which I've no doubt she will be. Looks like it now. Oh, don't cry, child. It worries me to hear people sniff. What do you hear from your mother? Father is much better. Oh, is he? Well, that won't last long, I fancy. March never had any stamina. You best be running along. Joe! You'll do fine. Just remember, it's not forever. 
I don't think I can bear it, but I'll try. Beth was much sicker than anyone suspected. Meg felt very anxious and a little guilty when she wrote letters in which no mention was made of Beth's illness. She could not think it right to deceive her mother, but she had been bidden to mind Hannah. I won't hear of Mrs. March being told and worried just for such a trifle. I do not doubt, Miss Hannah, that you are a great nurse. But Miss March isn't getting stronger. She just needs more time. She'll get better. She will. I'll be in next week to check. If her temperature hasn't gone down... It will have. The 1st of December was a wintry day indeed to them. For a bitter wind blew, the snow fell fast, and the year seemed getting ready for its death. Dr. Bangs had returned, but Beth's temperature hadn't fallen. If Mrs. March can leave her husband, she'd better be sent for. Joe, would you? I'll send a telegram. As Jo returned from her serious journey, she saw Laurie waiting outside the little brown house. What is it? Is Beth worse? I've sent for Mother. Oh, Jo, it's not so bad as that? Yes, it is. She doesn't know us. She doesn't look like my Beth, and there's nobody here to help us bear it. Mother and Father are both gone, and God seems so far away that I can't find him. I'm here. Hold on to me, Joe. She could not speak, but she did hold on, and the warm grasp of the friendly human hand comforted her sore heart. Laurie longed to say something tender and comfortable, but no fitting words came to him. So he stood silent, gently stroking her bent head as her mother used to do. Soon she dried the tears which had relieved her and looked up with a grateful face. Thank you, Teddy. Your mother will be here soon, and then everything will be all right. I'm glad Father is better. Hopefully she won't feel so bad about leaving him. It does seem as if all the troubles come in a heap. Well, I have some good news. Well, I hope good. I'd be grateful of anything in this moment. I telegraphed to your mother yesterday, and Brooke answered she'd come at once, and she'll be here tonight. Are you glad I did it? Glad? Lori, you're an angel. How shall I ever thank you? Everyone rejoiced about the news of Mother not being too far from home. Everyone but Beth. She lay in that heavy stupor, unconscious of hope and joy, doubt and danger. It was a piteous sight. The once rosy face so changed and vacant. The once busy hands so weak and wasted. All day, Joe and Meg hovered over her, watching, waiting, hoping, and trusting in God and Mother. And all day the snow fell, the bitter wind raged, and the hours dragged slowly by. There should be some change. Can't say if it will be for better or worse. Probably around midnight. I'll come back then. Hopefully your mother will have got home by then. If God spares Beth, I shall never complain again. I wish I had no heart. It aches so. If life is often as hard as this, I don't see how we ever shall get through it. Here the clock struck twelve, and both forgot themselves in watching Beth, for they fancied a change passed over her wan face. The house was still as death, and nothing but the wailing of the wind broke the deep hush. An hour went by and nothing happened. Another hour and still no one came. It was past two when Joe heard a movement by the bed, and turning quickly, saw Meg kneeling before their mother's easy chair with her face hidden, and Hannah and the doctor talking in low voices by Beth's bed. Joe looked over her small sister. The beloved little face looked so pale and peaceful in its utter repose, that Joe felt no desire to weep or to lament. Leaning low over the dearest of her sisters, she kissed the damp forehead with her heart on her lips. Goodbye, my Beth. Goodbye. What are you saying goodbye for? The fever's turned, she's sleeping natural. Her skin's damp, but she breathes easy. Thank God. Yes, my dears, 
I think the little girl will pull through this time. Keep the house quiet. Let her sleep. Oh, Joe, oh, she's going to be all right. If mother would only come now to see her girl fighting so hard. To see all my little women fighting hard. Mommy. Marmy! While these things were happening at home, Amy was having hard times at Aunt March's. For the first time in her life, she realized how much she was beloved and petted at home. Aunt March didn't approve of petting, but she meant to be kind, for Amy living with her pleased her very much, and Aunt March had a soft place in her old heart for her nephew's children, though she didn't like to confess it. If it had not been for Laurie coming every day, and Estelle, the maid, Amy felt that she never could have got through that dreadful time. Amy. Amy! Coming, Aunt March. Don't holler. Young ladies, don't holler. But you... What was that? Uh, nothing. I have something I would like to show you. Estelle? Here we are, Mrs. March's most precious belongings. This garnet your aunt wore when she was a debutante. You may find it hard to believe, but I was once as young and beautiful as you. These are so beautiful. Who gave you these? An old lover of your aunt. She had many admirers before she picked your uncle. Estelle, don't fill the young girl's head with such stories. Stories, are they? I am surrounded by insolent young women. I don't know what I've done to deserve such impertinence. Oh, I should go apologize. Let her be. One of her favorite things to do is sulk. She didn't show you the most important thing out of all of her treasures. It's just a plain gold band. Her wedding ring. It's too small for her fingers now, but it means more to her than her most precious jewel. I wish I knew where all these pretty things would go when Aunt March dies. To you and your sisters. Madame confided in me. I witnessed her will. How nice. But I wish she'd let us have them now. Procrastination is not agreeable. I have a fancy that that little turquoise ring will be given to you when you go. For Madame approves your good behavior and charming manners. Do you think so? Oh, I'll be a lamb if I can only have that lovely ring. It's ever so much prettier than Kitty Bryant's. I do like Aunt March after all. I don't think I have any words in which to tell the meaning of mother and daughters. Such hours are beautiful to live, but very hard to describe. So I will leave it to your imagination, merely saying that the house was full of genuine happiness. Mr. Brooke had promised to stay and nurse Mr. March while Mrs. March returned to Beth. That evening, while Meg was writing to her father to report the traveler's safe arrival, Joe slipped upstairs with a worried gesture and an undecided look. What is it, dear? I want to tell you something, Mother. About Meg? How did you guess? Yes, it's about her, and though it's a little thing, it bothers me. Beth is asleep. Speak low and tell me all about it. Last summer, Meg left a pair of gloves over at the Lawrence's, and only one was returned. We forgot about it till Teddy told me that Mr. Brooke had it. He likes Meg, but didn't dare say so, as he is so poor. What should we do? Do you think Meg cares for him? I don't know anything about love and such nonsense. In novels, the girls show it by blushing, fainting away, growing thin, and acting like fools. Now Meg doesn't do anything of the sort. Then you fancy that Meg is not interested in John? Who? Uh, Mr. Brooke. I call him John now. We fell into the way of doing it so at the hospital. You're going to take his part. What a rat to go petting Papa and helping you just to wheedle you into liking him. Joe, that's not the case at all. John went with me at Mr. Lawrence's request, and... He was perfectly open and honorable about Meg, for he told us he loved her, but would earn a comfortable home before he asked her to marry him. He only wanted our leave to love her and work for her and the right to woo her, if he could. He's a truly excellent young man, and we could not refuse to listen to him. She'll see those handsome eyes that she talks about, and then it will be all up with her. She's got such a soft heart, it'll melt like butter in the sun if anyone looks sentimentally at her. She read the short reports he sent more than she did your letters. She doesn't think John an ugly name, and she'll go and fall in love, and there's an end of peace and fun and cozy times together. I see it all. Oh. You do mind. 
I'd plan to have her marry Teddy by and by, and sit in the lap of luxury all her days. Wouldn't that be nice? I shouldn't have sighed, but you are exasperating. Don't make plans, Joe, but let time and their own hearts meet your friends. We can't meddle safely in such matters, and we'd better not get romantic rubbish, as you call it, into our heads, lest it spoil our friendship. Well, I won't. But I hate to see things going all crisscross and getting snarled up, when a pull here and a snip there would straighten it out. But buds will be roses, and kittens cats, more is the pity. What's that about roses and cats? I've finished the letter, Marmy. Only one of my stupid speeches. <sighs> I'm going to bed. Quite right, and beautifully written. Please add that I send my love to John. Do you call him John? Yes, he has been like a son to us, and we are very fond of him. I'm glad of that. He is so lonely. I'm glad father is not alone, but part of me wishes he had come back with you as well. They'll both be back soon enough, and then won't we be happy? Like sunshine after a storm were the peaceful weeks which followed. The invalids improved rapidly, and Mr. March began to talk of returning early in the new year. Beth was soon able to lie on the study sofa all day, amusing herself with the well-beloved cats. Several days of the unusually mild weather fitly ushered in a splendid Christmas day. Now and then, in this workaday world, things do happen in a delightful storybook fashion. And what a comfort that is. Here is a Christmas present for the March family. What a day to arrive home. Father. Robert. It's not real. It can't be real. Oh, my daddy is home. Girls, girls, hush. Remember, Beth is sleeping. How is my girl doing? She's doing very well. Thank you for asking. Beth, you shouldn't be out of bed. But Joy had put strength into the feeble limbs and Beth ran straight into her father's arms. <laughs> Never mind what happened just after that. For the full hearts overflowed, washing away the bitterness of the past and leaving only the sweetness of the present. I wanted to surprise you all. When the fine weather came, my doctor said I should take advantage of it and make the journey home. I had John here to keep me company, and he has been altogether the most estimable and upright young man. Thank you so much, John. I couldn't have got a better Christmas present. Glad to be of help, Miss March. I'll help Hannah with the tea. I hate estimable young men with brown eyes. There never was such a Christmas dinner as they had that day. The fat turkey was a sight to behold, so was the plum pudding, which melted in one's mouth. Mr. Lawrence and his grandson dined with them. Also Mr. Brooke, at whom Joe glowered darkly, to Laurie's infinite amusement. Just a year ago, we were groaning over the dismal Christmas we expected to have. Do you remember? Rather a pleasant year on the whole. I think it's been a pretty hard one. I'm glad it's over, because we've got you back. I may have been away more than a year, but in just one day, I can tell how you've all changed. Oh, tell us what they are. Give me your hand. I remember a time when this hand didn't look like it had done a day's work in its life, and your first care was to keep it so. It was pretty then, but to me it is much prettier now. I'm proud to shake this good, industrious little hand. What about Jo? Please say something nice, for she has tried so hard and been so very, very good to me. In spite of the curly crop, I don't see the tomboy whom I left a year ago. I rather miss my wild girl, but if I get a strong, helpful, tender-hearted woman in her place, I shall feel quite satisfied. I don't know whether this shearing sobered our black sheep, but I do know that in all Washington I couldn't find anything beautiful enough to be bought with the five and twenty dollars my good girl sent me. Oh, I'm still a little wild. I'm sure you are. Now, Beth. There's so little of her, I'm afraid to say much, for fear she will slip away altogether. Though she's not so shy as she used to be. I've got you safe, my Beth, and I'll keep you so. Amy's been very patient to hear the changes you see in her. I observed that Amy ran errands for her mother all afternoon, and has waited on everyone with patience and good humour. She's not even mentioned a very pretty ring which she wears, so I conclude that she has learned to think of other people more and of herself less. 
I am so proud of my lovable daughter, with her talent for making life beautiful for herself and others. Although the following days were joyful ones, something strange was happening with the older members of the March family. Mr. and Mrs. March would look at one another with an anxious expression as their eyes followed Meg. Joe was seen to shake her fist at Mr. Brooks' umbrella, which had been left in the hall. Meg was absent-minded, shy and silent, started when the bell rang, and blushed when John's name was mentioned. Everyone seems like they're waiting for something, which is queer since Father is safe at home now. I think it's strange that Laurie and Mr. Brooke haven't been over since Christmas. I'll go! Good afternoon. I came to get my umbrella. That is, to see how your father finds himself today. It's very well. He's in the rack. I'll go get him. Mother will like to see you. Pray sit down. I'll call her. Don't go. Mr. Brooke caught hold of Meg's hand in both his own, and looking down at Meg with so much love in his brown eyes that her heart began to flutter, and she both longed to run away and to stop and listen. I won't trouble you. I only want to know if you care for me a little. Meg? I don't know. Will you try and find out? Stealing a shy look at him, Meg saw that his eyes were merry as well as tender, and that he wore the satisfied smile of one who had no doubt of his success. It was this that, when she looked back on this moment, had won her over. What would have happened next, I cannot say, if Aunt March had not come hobbling in at this interesting minute. Bless me, what's all this? Aunt March, I'm so surprised to see you. <laughs> That's evident. But what is this man saying to make you look like a peony? There's mischief going on, and I insist upon knowing what it is. We were only talking. Mr. Brooke came for his umbrella. Brooke? That boy's tutor? Ah, I understand now. I know all about it. I made Joe tell me what was going on between the two of you. You haven't gone and accepted him, child. Aunt March, don't say such things. I have something to say to you. I must free my mind at once. Tell me, do you mean to marry this cook? If you do, not a penny of my money ever goes to you. Remember that and be a sensible girl. I shall marry whom I please, Aunt March, and you can leave your money to anyone you like. Heidi, tidy! Is that the way you take my advice, miss? You'll be sorry for it by and by, when you've tried love in a cottage and found it a failure. It can't be a worse one than some people find in big houses. Aunt March put on her glasses and took a look at the girl, for she did not know her in this new mood. Meg hardly knew herself. She felt so brave and independent, so glad to defend John and assert her right to love him, if she liked. Mr. Brooke looked on in amazement, in awe of the Meg that stood before him. Now, Meg, my dear, be reasonable and take my advice. I mean it kindly and don't want you to spoil your whole life by making a mistake at the beginning. You ought to marry well and help your family. It's your duty to make a rich match and it ought to be impressed upon you. Father and mother don't think so. They like John, though he is poor. Your parents, my dear, have no more worldly wisdom than a pair of babies. This rook is poor and hasn't any rich relations, has he? No. He has many warm friends. You can't live on friends. Try it and see how cool they'll grow. He hasn't any business, has he? Mr. Lawrence has offered to help me, ma'am. Oh, that won't last long. James Lawrence is a crotchety old fellow and not to be depended on. So you intend to marry a man without money, position, or business, and go on working harder than you do now when you might be comfortable all your days by minding me and doing better? I thought you had more sense, Meg. I couldn't do better if I waited half my life. John is good and wise. He's got heaps of talent. He's willing to work and sure to get on. He's so energetic and brave. Everyone likes and respects him, and I'm proud to think he cares for me, though I'm so poor and young and silly. He knows about my money. 
That's the secret of his liking, I suspect. Aunt March, how dare you say such a thing? My John wouldn't marry for money any more than I would. We are willing to work and we mean to wait. I'm not afraid of being poor, for I've been happy so far, and I know I shall be with him because he loves me and I... Meg stopped there, remembering all of a sudden that she hadn't made up her mind, that she hadn't told her John that she didn't even know if she cared for him, let alone love him. Aunt March was very angry, for she had set her heart on having her pretty niece make a fine match. And something in the girl's happy young face made the lonely old woman feel both sad and sour. Well, I wash my hands of the whole affair. You are a willful child, and you've lost more than you know by this piece of folly. I'm disappointed in you, and have spirits to see your father now. Don't expect anything from me when you're married. I've done with you forever. And slamming the door in Meg's face, Aunt March drove off. She seemed to take all the girl's courage with her, for when left alone, Meg stood for a moment, undecided whether to laugh or cry. Thank you for defending me, and Aunt March for proving that you do care for me a little bit. I didn't know how much till she abused you. I love you, Meg March. May I stay by your side and be happy? Yes, John. Joe came softly downstairs and paused with Meg at the parlor door. They listened to Mr. Brooke telling their parents about his plans for a married life with Meg. The eloquence and spirit with which he pleaded his suit made Meg even more sure of her decision. The tea bell rang before he had finished describing the paradise which he meant to earn for Meg, and he proudly took her into supper, both looking so happy that Joe hadn't the heart to be jealous or dismal. You can't say nothing pleasant ever happens now, can you, Meg? No, I'm sure I can't. Oh, how much has happened since I said that? It seems years ago. In most families there comes now and then a year full of events. This has been such a one, but it ends well after all. I hope the next will end better. I can't wait for the wedding. Christopher Columbus, I suppose it will be wedding talk until the big day. Laurie, you'll not talk of weddings, will you? I don't think there would be a wedding without me telling the Marches how wonderful you were. I'm much obliged for your recommendation of me, Laurie. I take it as a good omen for the future and invite you to the wedding on the spot. I'll come if I'm at the ends of the earth, for the sight of Joe's face alone on that occasion would be worth a long journey. Where is Joe? She was here a second ago, looking glum. I think she went up to the attic. I'll go! No, you stay here and be washed over with praise by your blushing bridegroom. Gladly. I honestly believe there couldn't be a finer match. I think you're right. Laurie bounded up to the garret where he found Joe, looking out of the attic window with misty eyes. You don't look festive, ma'am. <laughs> What's the matter? I don't approve of the match, but I've made up my mind to bear it, and she'll not say a word against it. You know you don't have to give her up. You only go halves. It can never be the same again. I've lost my dearest friend. I thought I was your dearest friend. I'm not good for much, I know. But I'll stand by you, Joe, all the days of my life. I know you will, and I'm ever so much obliged. You are always a great comfort to me, Teddy. Well, now, don't be dismal. There's a good fellow. Meg is happy. Brooke will fly round and get settled immediately. Grandpa will attend to him, and it will be very jolly to see Meg in her own little house. We'll have capital times after she is gone, for I shall be through college before long, and then we'll go abroad on some nice trip or other. Wouldn't that console you? I rather think it would, but there's no knowing what may happen next year. That's true. Don't you wish you could take a look forward and see where we shall all be then? I do. I think not, for I might see something sad, and everyone looks so happy now. I don't believe they could be much improved. Chapter 2 of Little Women was adapted and directed by Zoe Thomas Webb, edited by Craig Bates, with music composed by Dominic Pollard and Scott Killick. 
For this chapter, the cast included Kirsty Harrison as Joe, Paula Mount as Meg, Alex O'Donnell as Amy, Lexi Milligan as Beth, Sarah Perkins as Marmy, Tom Thornton as Mr. March, Sarah Kitchen as Hannah, Will Fallsworth as Laurie, Nick Mouton as Mr. Lawrence, Tom Osborne as Ned Vaughan, Jonathan Grant as Mr. Brooke, Adam Mulder as Fred Vaughan, Lizzie Iredale as Sally Gardner, Ellie Meacham as Kate Vaughan, Jean-Pierre Adjus as Dr. Bangs, Penny Weatherall as Aunt March, Ali Stadden as Estelle, and Catherine Goddard as Louisa.